<laughs> Wikipedia could back me up on that, by the way. <coughs> Very trustworthy source. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Joel. And uh, I'm going to ask whether there's life elsewhere in the galaxy. And I, I know you're all expecting me to just answer this question. Um, I think that there are a few Star Trek fans in the room. I <laughs> Some evidence of that. Uh, if you watch Star Trek, as some of you do, the, uh, the, the every planet they go to, every world they trip on is teeming with life, right? Usually at various stages of civilization or anarchy. Um, and if you look around our own solar system, it's sort of one horrible hellscape after the next, right? It's, a, you know, Venus, it rains acid. Mercury is, I don't know, 800 degrees. Uh, you know, Mars has global dust storms. Good luck for the settlers. Jupiter doesn't even have a surface, um, Pluto, it's got great lakes of liquid nitrogen. Well, anyway, you don't want to swim there. So I always got interested in asking, what, what's, what's the reality here? Is it Star Trek? Is it, is it all like these horrible, you know, how do you adapt to these places? Which is it? So uh, that's what got me into astronomy. Uh, and I think the formalization of this question is called the Drake Equation, which is a much maligned speculation by Frank Drake uh, on the population of the universe. So how many intelligent or any other kind of life species are there out there? And it's an equation, it's a very simple equation, it's just multiplication. But the idea is that you need to determine a number of parameters ranging from astronomy, biology, anthropology, and philosophy to uh, you know, get a single answer to this question. And it has to do with the number of planets, the odds of them being habitable, the odds of life forming on them, the odds of intelligent life forming on them, the length of time an intelligent civilization goes without blowing the crap out of itself, and do they send signals out? So uh, there's, a, there's a really fun concept called a Kardashev number. This is the idea that a civilization, uh, this is many orders of magnitude. Of, it's basically, you can measure uh, people's worth by how much energy they put out. This is not going to go over super well with the environmentalists. But that's sort of the general concept. It's, do, do, can, they, can they produce sort of one planet's surface worth of energy? Can they produce one sun's worth of energy? Uh, one galaxy's worth of energy? And you can do different experiments to test this. Um, there have been some really interesting experiments on this. We're fairly sure to the 20% level that some of the nearby galaxies don't harbor galaxy-spanning civilizations. And that's a really weak statement, but at least it's backed up by data. So what I want to point out to you is that there are a lot of stars out there, and I like to make understatements. This is a nice, dense portion of the sky, but what's interesting is this little smudge over here, which happens to be the, our nearest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the same size as the galaxy that we live in. So imagine if we were to fly into our own Milky Way and look at this beautiful Hubble image of Andromeda taken from over 400 different pointings over the course of about a month. And just imagine... Hopefully this gives you a little sense as we pan around of just how many stars are in Andromeda that Hubble can resolve. Make that analogous to our own uh, galaxy and you kind of get the idea. Or, or you could speculate that there are 100 billion galaxies like this. And Anyway, there's a lot of places out there. So clearly the number of planets in the universe, or the number of stars in the universe is quite large. Um, and we know from other missions that there are a lot of planets out there. Now, Hubble, I have to plug it since I now work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which does the science operations for Hubble and the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, um, launching at the end of 2018, mark your calendars. Uh, so Hubble has done a number of things. It's already started to, so now that we know there are planets and things like that, Hubble can, has taken just the first few uh, pioneering steps. And remember that when Hubble launched in 1990, the concept of looking for a planet around another star was still science fiction. So we hadn't found any. Uh, of course, it's observed geysers. It's found an ocean under Ganymede in our own solar system. Uh, it made the first uh, detection of an exoplanet atmosphere. Uh, and, of course, it's been tracing galaxies and heavy elements throughout cosmic time as everything other than hydrogen, helium, and lithium forms in the cores of stars. Uh, but the ultimate goal here is to find another living Earth. Okay? And so what was once science fiction is now becoming something we can actually do. So what's the plan? How are we going to find another Earth, another place to go, another place to find life? And I'm going to start here with something vaguely like us, so we can extrapolate out further. But uh, So first we need to determine the fraction of stars that have planets. We need to find the potentially habitable planets, 
and understand them. Let's say in this case, worlds where lakes and oceans of water, not nitrogen, could exist. And determine if any of these planets are inhabited. So the Kepler Space Telescope is the most famous planet hunter at this point, and it, it uses the sort of the transit method or the eclipse to watch planets that happen to pass in front of their star and shadow the light temporarily just enough to get a little dip in the total brightness of the star. And they look for planets doing this and uh, basically can measure the orbits of those planets. And it turns out Kepler has found over 5,000 planet candidates, at least 1,200 of which are confirmed as planets. And essentially the takeaway from Kepler is that most stars have planets, probably a lot of them. This is a picture of sort of a big aggregate of all of the planets that had been found by Kepler at the time of uh, beginning of last year, sort of orbiting around their, their star. So that's the size of the star and the size of the planet in shadow in front of it. Now what Kepler did was it stared at one portion of the sky 3,000 light years away for a very long time and waited for things to pass in front of it. So it was looking at one quarter of a percent of the sky, but in great detail. The next mission that I'm really excited about is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, which is going to inventory the entire sky, but close by, that blue circle there. It's going to look at all of the stars within a 200 light year radius for planets. So this is figuring out the demographics of our local neighborhood, the places we might want to move to, or at least could possibly make contact with. Because remember, round trip time of even a message at one year per light year. So 200 light years means it's a 400 year round trip. It's optimistic. <laughs> and of course the James Webb Space Telescope will play a key role here. Um, it will be able to determine the composition and atmosphere, not just the number of planets and I mean some of the other details, but what is what gases are in the atmospheres of these planets as they pass in front of their stars. Things like methane, water, water vapor, um, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, different gases and things that are influenced may be influenced by biotic processes. Very intriguing. Problem with the James Webb is it'll really only detect, it'll only be able to do this on a handful of planets that are orbiting nearby stars that are smaller than the sun. So these are not likely to be the habitable planets, but it can certainly make the measurement, so we'll see what happens. Um, w first, which will hopefully have a much better name by the time it launches, I'll take suggestions if anyone, uh, has an interesting technology inside of it called a coronagraph. And this is a really key thing. Uh, if you look at a star and you want to measure an Earth-sized, Earth-sized habitable planet next to it, you have a serious contrast issue. You're trying to measure something that's like a billion times brighter. So this is the equivalent uh, challenge to, let's say that there was no atmosphere. This would be the equivalent challenge of trying to measure a firefly next to a spotlight in Los Angeles from New York. So it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to do. So what you do is you, you block out the bright thing next to it and try to see the dim thing. It's like trying to read a, a book in the dark when they're shining a flashlight in your face and not on the paper. So it's pretty challenging. Uh, but you could do that and you could do this internally or externally, but the idea in W first is it has an internal little blocker thing which blocks out the light from the central star. So believe it or not, in this picture there are three planets hiding around the star and there they are when they're, this is done with a ground-based telescope, but the idea is the same for W first. And W first will take amazing pictures 100 times the field of view of Hubble, so it will do a lot of planet studies using both this technique and another one called microlensing. So but what we need, again, is so what James Webb might reveal for a few worlds, we need for a lot of them, and we need not just the diagnostics of carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor, which come, this is a, uh, by the way, this is a spectrum. I hate to show data at all in these talks, but the idea is that th this is an actual spectrum of the Earth. We took, there was an instrument that pointed back at the Earth, took a spectrum, and it looks like this, with these little dips and rises. And these dips and rises are actually indicators of these things, this dip falls at a very specific frequency, it means there's methane. Could that mean anaerobic bacteria? Uh, let's ask Captain Kirk later. The carbon dioxide suggests possible volcanic activity, water vapor. This is all great for looking at our own outer solar system and for exoplanets. But we need to fill in the rest of the gap. We need stuff over here. There's a vegetation jump. There's the blue sky. There's oxygen and ozone. And these are all more towards the visible light end of the spectrum. So how do we do that? 
So we've got Hubble. It's been trailblazing these searches. We've got Kepler and TESS. They found tons of planets, providing statistical constraints. W first will also help there. And it will be an in-space verification for this high contrast imaging where we can get a billion to one or better contrast. And we have James Webb, which will be taking spectra of planets larger than the Earth around stars smaller than the sun. So what's missing? The thing is, it's basically just size of these telescopes. We need a bigger telescope to resolve these things with all of these technologies. So for example, you were to launch a four meter diameter telescope into space, there would be about four stars that you could make this, this measurement for. If, whereas if you launch an eight meter, it's 15 stars. If you launch a 16 meter, it's 60 stars. So it's roughly going as the square. So 60 stars is a pretty good sample. This assumes that one-tenth of all stars have an Earth-like planet. If it's 100%, then you'll get 600. If it's less than that, you'll have fewer. But the point is you need to look, you need the option at least of looking at a bunch of stars. So this is my case to you. We need a pretty big telescope and we need to stick it in space. So we need a contrast increase here that basically that would take the equivalent of an old standard def TV and bring it to ultra high definition just to use a very antiquated term. So what we need is an image sharpness increase from Hubble to this new telescope at that same ratio, the, which we're gonna, I'm gonna call this talk the high definition space telescope. So it's a simple equation, a greater than 10 meter telescope, more than 50 Earths. Life, aliens, who knows? How do you build a telescope this big? Well, this is what, here's a speculation of what it might look like. Here's Hubble and John Grunsfeld, an astronaut for scale down here who was actually one of the ones who serviced it. This is what James Webb would look like. And here's the high definition taste space telescope. Yeah, it's a little scary. This is the 16 meter version. I don't know exactly how big it'll end up. But if you want to build a telescope like that, you need a really big rocket. They lost the plans for the Saturn V. So, the <laughs> the so we're really excited by NASA's space launch system with its 10 meter cargo fairing. Um, you can stuff a 16 meter telescope by folding it up like an origami yeah, believe it or not, it works. We're going to try test this out with James Webb, so it'll work. <laughs> We're going to get this thing into space. and I mean, or The other option, of course, is to build it in orbit, but anyway. So the point is, this kind of technology is critical to taking the next step, and I think the next step here is big, because this is one of the greatest you know, philosophical questions right in the universe, are we alone? And it's one that could just be turned from a philosophical question to an actual scientific question that we could answer in the next 50 years. And I just think that's incredibly exciting. So that's my pitch to you. And uh, thank you and I'll take questions. All right, questions for Destroyer of Worlds. You can even ask why I picked that nickname, because it has nothing to do with this talk. Yeah, it had to do with your other talk. You know, it made sense. Straight here in the front, or middle. Uh, the current system can only detect planets if they're in between the star and us. Do we have any hypothetical means to be able to detect the planet if it is orbiting above or below the star? That's one of the big advantages of this big telescope. It can actually resolve the planet from the star so that it doesn't have to be passing in front of it. Yeah, that's kind of the point of this. Right up front. What is this 52-foot diameter uh, telescope going to So one of the interesting, th I couldn't tell you exactly, but James Webb, which is 6.5 meters, so what is that, 21 feet, uh, weighs half as much as Hubble, even though it's much bigger. And that's because they used... Uh, carbon fiber to build the, uh, the, the, the the substructure and things like that. And they use the lightweight beryllium, right? So they made a conscious decision to make it a lighter telescope. Also to make it not serviceable gave it some advantages. So the fact that astronauts could not go to it meant they didn't have to put on all this extra stuff that Hubble has. So there's a lot of, by the way, Hubble's total power usage is that of a hairdryer. I think that's a fun fact. Uh, so I don't know, the tw I guess the 12 meters should weigh roughly four times as much, but that's a rough guess. The point is that uh, did you get that much thrust? I mean, we could do it. The space launch system could do it. Right up front here. Do you have an informed speculation about how many Earth-like planets we will find in this galaxy once we have the telescope? I mean, th there are a lot of, this is controversial. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of data on this, and I certainly the, uh, a popular estimate for the, the, the uh, Earth fraction 
based on extrapolation from the Kepler data and some other stuff, is 0.1. So 10% of stars would have an Earth. If that's true, then this high-definition telescope should be able to look at 60 of them. And it depends on what instruments are on it, but we could, instead of spending more time looking at one, or sorry, a, a short time looking at a lot of them, we could pick one we really like, stare at that even longer, and maybe add some extra diagnostics that would help eliminate some of the false positives that could be generated by natural processes instead of biotic things. That's going to be the challenge, is convincing ourselves that what we saw was definitely due to the modification of something on that planet. All right, one more question for Destroyer of Worlds right over here. The Comet Swarm, or whatever it is. <laughs> what other things, in like in what context? Or just on that star. Uh, the, the, so, we already know that planetary systems, I mean, I guess the, the simplest thing to say is that planetary systems come in all shapes and sizes already. Uh, Kepler has found some amazing examples. So, for example, there's a system with six planets closer to their star than Venus is to the Sun, and I think five of them are closer than Mercury. This is ridiculous. Six planets that are all, you know, 800 degrees and should be melting or destroyed, be destroyed in a while. So, like, that's pretty confusing. Um, to look for systems with incredibly inclined orbits, planets that are orbiting, the you know, completely skewed out of their system, not just Pluto, but big ones. You know, Pluto does this, which is one of the reasons it got in trouble. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I mean, I'm actually very interested in how systems like this form. So uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is all that stuff that you can detect, not just in the planets themselves, but in the material that's crashing together to make those planets. So rocks, things that are make up the Earth's mantle, things like that, we can see mashed together into these larger and larger structures. So I think there's a lot out there. I think that the basic lesson, since the first planet we found was some hot was some Jupiter that was really close to the to its star, right? It's a massive planet that could not possibly have formed where we found it. I think it's pretty clear that we can expect almost any configuration to be possible. So the question is, what's the common one? And that's why I'm most interested in this, because it can answer demographically across the galaxy how many of these systems are falling neatly into the kind of ordering that we would expect to be supportive of life. And that's that's kind of a neat problem you can't just answer by staring at a few of them. So. All right, let's thank Destroy of Worlds one more time. <laughs>